All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. We may have a couple others join us later on, but just wanted to say thank you for being here for our first webinar designed specifically for leaders in mid-sized cities um, who are seeking to understand how to navigate federal relationships and specifically how to take advantage of opportunities like earmarks. We know this was a quick turnaround for you guys. Um, I sent out the invite last week and we just found out, we were notified last week about the upcoming deadline for earmarks, but hopefully this will still be helpful for you to understand the process and also any opportunities in the future. So this session is going to offer a brief introduction to member-directed spending, also known as community project funding or earmarks. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with appropriations process. And then we're also just going to provide a general overview of um, casework, constituent services, and the role that congressional staff play as agency liaisons. Um, you know, for me as a local leader in, in local government, this has been super helpful to learn from my colleagues on navigating federal relationships in the process, and I hope it'll be the same for you. And this webinar is just one example of the type of content that we hope to offer as we're launching a network of mid-sized cities next year. I hope that you'll consider joining the network and keep engaging in similar conversations with other leaders in local government. While there's a variety of amazing resources and organizations that support cities, um, my experience has been that most of those are tailored for larger cities. And so this, those of us that are in smaller communities um, are often left behind and left scrambling. So we wanna make sure that we provide the same level of access and support to build capacity, encourage innovation and increase civic engagement among cities. So I, um, as I've mentioned in my invite to you all, my name is Lauren Kirk. I am the Chief Innovation Officer for the City of Jackson, Tennessee, but I'm also a fellow with the Pop Box Foundation where I've been focused on local government and building capacity of local government and launching this network of leaders. So I've worked in local government myself the last four years, which in some ways for those of us that started before COVID has felt like 10 um, with a lot to learn re really quickly on how to navigate a pandemic and things like that. Um, so I would not be where I'm at today without the support of others um, like Anne and Catherine, who I'm honored to introduce and have share with us today um, to kind of learn the process and learn how we can advocate for our communities. Um, so while I have been focused on a smaller geographic scale with local government at Pop Fox Foundation, I'm honored to be joined by two of my colleagues who have a wealth of knowledge and experience at the federal level, um, serving constituents on a much larger scale. So. I'm going to start off by introducing Anne. So Anne Meeker was a founding member of the Pop Box Foundation team as the Director of Strategic Initiatives, and she's now serving as our Deputy Director. She previously served as Director of Constituent Services for Congressman Seth Moulton, where she worked to use data and technology to deliver smarter casework services to the residents of Massachusetts 6. Anne holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Oxford, Oxford, to pronounce that today, um, and a master's in science and history from the London School of Economics, where she wrote her thesis on presidential memoir. I'm really curious about that thesis, Anne. Um, and she's also a proud native Clevelander, where she's currently based out of her new home. So Anne, thanks for being here and joining us. And then also joined by my lovely colleague, Catherine, today. So Catherine Long, um, is now joining us with the Pop Box Foundation as our casework program senior fellow. Um, but prior to that, she has been serving with um, Senator Leahy's Vermont office for 15 years in constituent services, working with a variety of cases um, over his, you know, and over his transition also out of office for after serving for 48 years in office. Um, so she primarily focused on military and veteran affairs, housing and taxes. And she also worked to repatriate American citizens during crisis situations, which is super impressive. Um, prior to joining Senator Leahy's staff, Catherine was the Director of Public Policy for the Vermont Alliance of Nonprofit Organizations, a training fellow for the Center of Lobbying and Public Interest, and adjunct faculty at St. Michael's College, where she developed and conducted training for nonprofit leaders and advocacy strategies and lobbying roles. So clearly I'm among very impressive people here today with a variety of experience and background. Um, so we're gonna start with just a quick overview of presentation by Catherine and Anne to kind of set the stage for everyone, give us a, all an idea of the structure and scope of congressional offices, the earmarks process and other funding opportunities, but we'll have plenty of time for Q and A. So feel free to drop your questions in the box if you know you already have some, or if you have some as we go. And Anne, Catherine, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you. 
Awesome. Lauren, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us and for, for setting up this event today. We're so excited to see the launch of this network for, for small and mid-sized cities um, and delighted to be here to talk about some of our favorite things to talk about, which is congressional offices and what you can ask for from your local congressional office. Um, as Lauren mentioned, Catherine and I uh, both worked in our district in district offices for a, a member of the House and a member of the Senate. Um, which is a little bit of a different perspective on what congressional offices do than you might uh, get when you're just talking about your DC offices. So we want to kind of focus today on some of the services in particular that district offices provide, but also give a little bit of a general overview for some of the things that you may be able to ask for that you may not have known about from your congressional offices. So let's, um, I realize this may be familiar. I see some familiar faces joining us today. So pardon me if I'm, I'm going over things that you're already familiar with, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, just wanted to give a quick overview of a typical congressional org chart. So you know who you might be talking to. Um, some offices will structure their, their, their team a little bit differently. Basically each member, uh, it's up to each member to decide how they wanna structure their team, how they wanna spend their budget, who they wanna hire, what titles they wanna hire for. But the vast majority of congressional mm -hmm. offices will look like this. Obviously, we have the member at the top. Members can split their team between their state or their district and DC. Right under the members, the chief of staff who basically runs the whole operation. That chief is most of the time based in DC, but for some, uh, they'll either be based in the district or they'll spend quite a bit of time in the district. If you walk into your, your uh, local congressional office's district or state office, person in charge there is going to be your district or your state director, and then they're basically in charge of two big teams. Their outreach and field reps who actually go out into the community, build those relationships, do some of the on the ground research for what's going on in that district or state. What does the member need to know about? They'll do some of the kind of convening and bringing folks together. And then you'll have your constituent services team or your casework team. And those folks stay in the mostly in the office. They're there to handle constituent questions, um, issues with federal agencies. Catherine is going to give us an overview, a uh, more in-depth overview of that in a little bit here. And then in your DC team, uh, same thing, you usually have two kind of folks who are mainly in charge there, your legislative director and your communications director. Legislative director, obviously in charge of uh, the of writing bills, of amendments, of co-sponsorships, of oversight, hearings, all that good stuff. And then your comms team, actually responsible for the members' public presence, their website, their social media, what's going on in your local media, earned media, all that good stuff. Um, so the last thing I just want to emphasize here is I think some advocacy trainings are going to tell you, you know, you have to have the member's attention, you have to meet with the member, you have to talk directly to the member. And one thing I really want to emphasize is that isn't always the case. Um, all of these folks are incredibly professional and really well trained and uh, can be really helpful and are also a lot more accessible. Um, in the House, every member serves 750,000 constituents. So it can be really, really tough to get that member's time. But staff are there to be helpful to you. They're there to answer your questions. They're there to be to be a help for you. Um, so it can be a lot easier to get in touch with them. And they're going to be, hopefully, <laughs> pretty responsive. So uh, as Lauren mentioned, I'm going to dive in a little bit on the funding options uh, that may be available through your member of Congress that you may not have been aware of. So a couple that I'm going to focus on today, uh, as Lauren mentioned, are earmarks, grants, and then other opportunities uh, through appropriations. So let's dive into those. Um, Grants. There are so many grant opportunities available for local governments, for, for small cities, for mid-sized cities, for everybody, uh, large cities, everybody in between. Uh, if you're not already familiar with grants.gov, it can be a little intimidating, but they've actually done a really good job of making grants.gov a lot easier to use. So for most congressional offices, this is where they're going to send you if you start looking for grants. If you just call their office and say, hey, I'm a local, I'm a local councilman. I'm looking for, for money for this project. They'll say, hey, you know, here's this resource, go check out grants.gov. But then where can they can be helpful for you is in writing letters of support. So every office is gonna have a slightly different process for how they do letters of support. Some of them um, uh, may only choose to write a letter of support for an entity, for a local government, for a nonprofit that they've worked with in the past. Some have a formal process for requesting that letter of support. And for a lot of those grant applications, you know, that letter of support might not be the thing that automatically gets you approved, but it can be really helpful. It shows, um, you know, it shows community support. It shows, it kind of adds a little bit of weight to that application. So that's something that can be really helpful. Some offices also run a grants newsletter where they flag uh, particular grants that are helpful in their communities. So uh, definitely it was worth reaching out to your congressional office to just ask, hey, what support do you offer if we're applying for grants? Do you have a letter of support process? Do you run a grants newsletter? What are your rules for doing that grant news, grants newsletter? What are your rules for if we're uh, coming to you to ask for a letter of support? What's your process? 
um, and then just figure out how can how can you leverage that support as you're as you're making these grant applications. Um, last thing I'll say, if you do work at the congressional office on those grant applications, it's really helpful just to follow up to say thank you. Uh, one thing that every member of Congress will do after they help get uh, write a letter of support that gets a favorable grant is they're going to send out a press release. They're going to send out something that says, you know, Senator Brown announced that it was able to help secure $1.1 million for this thing that's going to be helpful in their community. So biggest thing to be helpful to that congressional office and make sure that they will keep writing you letters of support for those grants is to help get them set up for that press release. So if you send out a press release, send it on that way. Be prepared to provide a quote that they can include in the press release that's going to be helpful. Again, all of that just relationship building to make sure that you're successful in that first letter of support uh, request, and then you're successful in subsequent ones as well. So that's just a small thing that can be helpful. And let's talk about the big one. Um, let's talk about earmarks. Earmarks are basically grants, but a lot more complicated. But in some ways, they can actually be easier for local for local governments to do than the grant process. So if you go through grants.gov, depending on the agency, it's usually going to be a pretty involved process. There are going to be a lot of questions that you need to answer. There might be matching funds that you have to demonstrate that you have. Um, and then most of those grants go through the agency that's responsible for, for awarding the grant. Earmarks are different. So earmarks actually run through the federal budgeting process. Um, and there are opportunities for individual members of Congress to say, in this gigantic federal budget, I would like this money set aside for this project within my district. Uh, there are some rules to earmarks. They're short term. The federal budgeting process happens at one year at a time. So earmarks can only be awarded for one year at a time for one year spending. They are limited to nonprofits and local government and excuse me, and government entities that state, local and tribal. They have to be place based. So it can't be if you're a national nonprofit, it can't be, you know, I would like earmarked, I would like earmark money to do things in 45 cities. It has to be I'm doing this project in this particular city. They're also only open to certain issue areas and I'll show a list in a second. Um, but you can't just ask for an earmark on anything that you want. It has to be under certain topics. Um, and they're not guaranteed. Um, if you have been following the news uh, with Congress at all, you know that the federal budget, federal spending process is going to be a little bit complicated this year. If we don't go through the actual, if we don't actually pass spending bills and we end up in a continuing resolution, even if members of Congress request earmarks, they may not actually be, be honored. So it's not guaranteed funding. So the fact that it's not guaranteed and it's short term means that this should be nice to have requests. It's This is not an appropriate use for, not an appropriate way to fund things that you have to do or that you have to do long term. But if you're looking for money that's for one project that's not critical to your operations, but would be really nice to have, earmarks are something you might want to consider. And the last thing I'll mention is that they're also subject to audit. Um, they have to be posted transparently on the member's website and on the committee's website. And then the Government Accountability Office also reviews a section of them or reviews a sample of them every year. Um, let me just also flag a note on terms. So I keep using the term earmark, and I just want to make clear when you talk to your member of Congress about, uh, I would like an earmark, you should be prepared to understand the terms. So earmark is the historical term. Uh, earmarks have been around in some form or another since uh, since Congress itself, um, a little bit more recently in this current form since the 1970s. Uh, you'll still see the term earmark used, but earmarks were actually banned in 2011, and then they were banned for that 10 year period, and then they recently came back. They were banned because there were some issues with corruption, we went 10 years without them, and then a couple of years ago, Congress decided let's bring them back because it's important that members of Congress get a little bit of a little bit more of a window into how funds are spent within their districts. Okay. Um, so when it came back, it was actually it came back under two different names. So if you're requesting an earmark in the Senate, it's going to be called congressionally directed spending. If you're requesting in the House, it's going to be called community project funding. This is all the same thing, and an earmark covers all of it. But if you'd like to use the correct term that works on both chambers, um, you can also call it member-directed spending. So just a note to be careful on what you're asking for. Um, as we mentioned, earmarks are a portion of federal spending. There's a lot of misinformation going out there, going around about just how much are, you know, how much money is going out in earmarks. So I just want to make it clear too. Um, the federal spending process is about discretionary spending. So we have our mandatory spending. This is on things like Social Security and Medicare. This is our, and then we have 8% of our spending for the federal budget goes to interest. 31% is discretionary spending. Earmarks are capped for both chambers at 1% of that. So it's an enormous amount of money available in comparison to the amount that's available for most local cities and towns. 
but in the context of the federal budget, it's a very small amount. Okay, let's talk about those open accounts, because um, it's important if you're considering applying for this year's cycle. The House has just introduced some changes to how they're handling earmarks. So this is the whole amount, this is the whole list of open accounts that have been open on both chambers. Things in italics are only going to be open in the Senate for this cycle. Basically, the House dropped two, um, two big buckets of, of eligible accounts. Um, so they're not funding things that, re that relate to labor, to health, to education, to financial services, general government, or defense. The Senate is still funding them. But that means that if you're interested in one of these uh, one of these accounts that's in italics here, you're going to want to talk to the Senate, uh, and that's your only option there. For things that aren't in italics, um, these are funded by both the House and the Senate, so you have the option to work with your House member or with your senator. So, for example, um, I always find it's helpful to kind of come back to a concrete concrete example for what an earmark looks like. This was a really great. Um, this is a really fascinating example from a uh, from a member out in, out in um. Iowa. So she was approached. So she, you know, did her outreach to her community and said, hey, earmarks are available. Come talk to me if you'd like, if you're considering earmark. Um, and she got this response from a local fire department out in a rural part of her district that said, hey, uh, we need to build a new, we need to build a new, a new building for our fire, our fire engine. She said, you know, I don't really understand what, what's going on here. And they actually sent her the video of their fire engine couldn't actually fit through the garage door that was in the, that they had set up in the old fire department building. Um, so she worked with their, with their team, they put together the earmark request, it was actually enacted in the full amount. So members can request a certain amount, and the committee can decide to fund that to fund that request at all, or to fund it at a different level. So this is one of the few that actually went through at the full amount. Um, the committee said, this is a great use of funds, you can have the full half a million dollars that you've requested. So just to make it a little bit clearer for what, um, what kinds of projects can be funded through earmarks. Okay, like I said, um, this year is a little bit is a little bit goofy uh, for, compared to previous years in that we do have some tighter restrictions on the House side. For requesters, this is probably not something that you really have to worry about. I just want you to be aware of it, that um, there are some changes on the House side. Again, some of those eligible accounts are gone. Um, the House is requiring its members to submit a little bit of extra information with their earmark requests. So just so you're aware of the background there. Um, and then, like we said, it's it's still a little bit of a question mark if earmarks are going to make it all the way through the budget process. So, again, keep in mind that this should be a nice to have and not uh, not an absolutely vital. So, if you are interested in doing this, the very first step for you is to reach out to your rep, reach out to your senator. Uh, not every rep, not every senator will do earmarks, so it's worth doing a little bit of research from last year, or just giving that your offices a call. Say, are you guys taking applications for member directed spending, community project funding, congressionally directed spending? Is this an option that we can pursue? And then what is going to be your process? Each member has a slightly different process. So it's worth just reaching out, getting all the information you can early. Um, I realize how little time this is, but I do just want to make it clear. Some offices are setting their deadlines as early as this Friday. So if this is something you're interested in, we do have a ton of resources available at popbox.org slash earmarks. We have our DIY guide for local governments um, interested in pursuing earmarks. We have um, a cheat sheet with the deadlines for this year and a cheat sheet for just what to, what to expect in the process. That DIY guide gets a little bit more into the detail of um, what to expect and how to work with your rep, how to work with your senator. Uh, and then we also have the full list of open eligible accounts and each of those has a sample project so you can see what kinds of projects get funded through which account. So definitely recommend going through those resources and please, please, please reach out to us if you have questions, overall questions on the program um, or if anything's not clear in those. We hope that's helpful. So understanding that the, uh, that the window for earmarks is so, so, so short this year, I do just want to flag that there are a bunch of other options for federal funding as well that also go through the appropriations process, but uh, through other processes with the federal funding and federal budgeting as well. So in addition to earmarks, members can make a few other types of requests in this annual appropriations process. Um, they can request that the levels of funding for federal programs change. They can request um, beyond appropriation, they can request that funding for um, funding for local priorities be included in other types of legislation in authorizing legislation that allows uh, that allows the federal government to spend money on certain priorities 
you might hear things about like the Farm Bill or the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Um, these are kind of the big pieces of legislation that reauthorize big sections of the federal government. So sometimes local priorities can be included in those. The effectiveness of, of how your member can actually get your priorities into those is going to depend on the member. It's going to depend on their team, on their committee assignment. Are they in the majority or the mi minority this year? Are they senior on their committees? But the big thing that I want you to take away is that you don't have to keep these straight. The biggest thing is that your congressional office wants to know about your priorities, um, but they can't work to get your priorities into any of these other funding vehicles unless they know about them. So it's really worth just reaching out if you haven't already, starting that relationship, starting that conversation, um, and making sure that they know what they can do for you, because they always want to be showing, hey, we got a local win for our district. We heard from our local uh, local city that this was important, and we worked to make it happen. So it's really worth just starting that conversation. Um, the worst they can do is say no. And then just also to be aware, <laughs> so earmarks are, are different because it's so it's so fast. If you make an earmark request, if it gets into the bill, if it gets enacted in the bill, the bill gets passed, you'll get that funding in a year. Other funding vehicles may take more time. Uh, so it's also just worth noting, expressing those priorities is really important, but sometimes the federal funding process is long and it's complicated. So just be ready for the long haul, be ready to kind of build those long-term relationships um, and uh, yeah, be willing to kind of work with your congressional office and understand how long it may take, but just kind of to keep the pressure up and keep saying this continues to be a priority. What are we doing this year? What are we doing next year? How are we going to make this happen? So that's the very quick overview of federal funding. Um, I welcome your questions. We're going to have tons of time for them. But at this point, let me turn it over to Catherine, who's going to talk about constituent services. Thanks, Anne. Um... I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, the kind words from Lauren. Um, really excited about this work that you are doing on behalf of um, mid-sized cities um, and coming from a, a rural state with uh, 600,000 people. Um, small is definitely something that I can relate to. Um, but I wanna talk today a little bit about um, constituent services and what that means and how that can kind of dovetail with the funding requests that Anne was talking about um, and also help to build your relationship with your congressional delegation. Um, you know, if you've maybe been a little bit shy to, to reach out to them. So when we talk about constituent services or casework, in its simplest form, casework is when members of Congress and their staff work on behalf of constituents to resolve difficulties with federal agencies in, in, in accordance with the law. Um, when you look at the Constitution, um, uh, uh, the authority to do casework is really derived from two places in the Constitution. And first is with the Article I, power to make the laws and conduct oversight. And the second is with the public's right to petition um, uh, under the First Amendment. So when you think about, um, you know, you've got the Constitution, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, um, you know, Congress is there on that left-hand side, um, and then all of those federal agencies under the executive branch are places where you as a, a municipal leader might have an interest in, um, in getting some information or resolving a problem. And, uh, folks in Congress are, are there to help you with that. Um, and so when you talk about casework, you definitely are not just talking about individuals. Um, a lot of casework is, um, is done by individuals and in a congressional office, the caseworker might be dealing primarily with individuals, but may also be thinking of constituents as businesses, nonprofits and municipalities. Um, so when you call the office, if you have any you know, question about who you, what type of person you should be talking to, again, you know, that's up to them to help figure, figure out who the right person is for you, um, but just know that um, that you, as a as an individual or, or as a municipal leader, have um, have every right, and it's very helpful to members of Congress to hear from you. I wanted to just talk about some of the common asks that individuals might have for uh, for a federal office, um, because 
um, I'm sure that some of your constituents come to you with questions and you may not know where to direct them um, so that you can see that there's a huge list of things um, that congressional offices might be helping with um, from military funerals to um, refugee resettlement. Um, and then sort of down on the that far side, you're looking more at the, some of the things that SBA issues and Section 8 issues, workers' comp, um, all of these kinds of things might be handled um, by a congressional office on behalf of constituents. Um, some of the common asks by businesses and nonprofits, um, again, might be a little, you might not realize that a congressional office could help with that. Um, businesses could come to um, their member of Congress around an IRS issue. Um, uh, in, in our office, we had a lot of interest in um, the um, employee retention tax credit, which was part of the COVID relief. Um, some businesses that were really relying on that money to um, keep the lights on um, found that there were some delays with that. Um, so by coming to the congressional offices, they were able to get a status on that. Um, Another one that uh, is a little bit random is Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax and Trade Bureau, which issues um, uh, going back uh, <laughs> to the prohibition days, um, they issued distillery permits um, if you if you want to start uh, uh, and a cider operation and the apples are rotting on the trees while you're waiting for that, um, that would be a great um, ask for your congressional delegation. Um, and then uh, nonprofits often come with issues related to their tax exempt status. Um, they might come with technical issues related to grants and payments or um, to the unique I entity identifier, which is required to access federal funds, as well as agency specific um, issues that they might have, um, say with a, a grant or a loan that they have with an agency like USDA Rural Development, HUD or EPA. Um, and then um, the common ask by municipalities, uh, no doubt um, all of you have had some opportunity to deal with FEMA. Um, so that's one that is a classic um, ask by municipalities regarding disaster declarations and public assistance. Um, another one, uh, I, I believe that today um, the states of Virginia and Maryland are both making presentations to GSA trying to see if they can um, land the siting of the FBI um, new offices. Um, so, you know, that might be something where, uh, you know, a passport agency in Jackson, Tennessee would be the perfect um, economic driver for your community. Um, Department of Defense, um, sometimes there's issues, uh, Camp Lejeune, for example, um, where there was contaminated water. Again, the EPA might be looking at PFAS in schools. All of these things might be something that a municipality would be um, needing to communicate with a federal agency about. Of course, there's postal service delivery issues and siting. And then, you know, you might have a question about um, rules that HUD has for, you know, pandemic um, uh, inspections, that kind of thing. So you can see that there's a huge array of, of things that you might want to reach out to your congressional delegation about. Um, there are some things that um, you would not um, ask about. Um, that might be something that's either out of the district, out of your state, or not related to a federal agency. Um, although I think many offices do really wanna be helpful and we'll try to redirect you to the appropriate place. Um, you're typically not gonna to wanna to ask for an exception. Um, in some cases, there's a, sort of a formal process for what's called an exception to policy. But in most cases, you're not asking to be treated special. Um, you're not asking to overturn outside of an established process or um, require any undue or improper pressure on agencies. I think a lot of times um, folks think that um, asking a member of Congress to get involved in a federal issue is sort of something that you do if you have pull. And I think understanding that it's your right um, as a, a constituent to um, ask for assistance with the federal government 
kind of frames that a little bit differently and um, maybe can give you the confidence to make that call. Another area that a member of Congress isn't going to get involved in would be in a legal action of any kind. Um, and they're also not going to provide you with legal advice or direction around what you should do. Um, you know, should you file a lawsuit, um, they're going to refer you to an attorney. And then, of course, um, you're um, not going to want to ask them to engage in fraud or any other kind of illegal activity. Goes without saying. Um, when you call your um, congressional office, um, I think Anne's point was really great. A lot of folks think that they need to talk to the member, and talking to the member is great, but on the, on the back side, the member is going to ask the staff, what is it we can do about this? Um, so establishing the relationship with the staff is really, really critical. Um, and in the state office, you can often do that more easily than in the D.C. office and understand that they're all part of the same office. Um, so you can always contact either your senator or your representative. Oftentimes you might want to contact both of them. Um, casework is done on a totally nonpartisan basis. It doesn't matter who, um, who someone votes for. Um, if they're going to contact um, that member's office. And in some ways, it doesn't even matter whether the member supports whatever the program is that you're asking about. Um, you can call directly um, or you can ask for a warm handoff or introduction. As I mentioned before, you might just call the office and say, I have this kind of a problem. Who would be best to help me with that? Um, while individual cases are likely to be handled by a caseworker, municipal cases might be handled by a field rep. Sometimes a field rep will hand something off to a caseworker. For example, um, those issues are around the um, grants.gov and the unique identity uh, entity identifiers. Um, we had cases where municipal municipalities that were incorporated in the 1700s were being asked to provide their incorporation documentation to the GSA. Um, and that became a little more complicated for them in order to them to access the federal funds. Um, typically, there'll be some kind of an intake conversation. And then if a formal inquiry is being made to the federal agency, um, you'll be asked to um, complete a privacy um, act release. Then the time frame for resolution will depend on the problem or the agency, but the caseworker will typically give you an idea of how long um, that process may take. And I would certainly encourage you to go back to them if you have a question on the status. Um, and just to kind of give you some visibility on what happens when you make that request, um, we uh, as or as congressional caseworkers uh, um, and congressional offices have the keys to the kingdom, which is uh, this list that's prepared by the um, Congressional Research Service and is constantly updated. It's a list of congressional liaisons of, it says selected federal agencies, but really they've got almost all of them. Um, so uh, calling your member of Congress, they're gonna be able to find the point of contact that you need at HUD, that you need at FEMA. It might be the local contact. It might be the national contact. Um, it might be that there's sort of an informal question you wanna ask or a formal question. Um, those contacts that they provide from that list are um, uh, private um, to members of Congress. So, so um, you, they can't just give you the list and, and let you go with that. But what they can do is ask for, for the agency to provide you with a contact as municipality. You're having a problem that you need to resolve with HUD. Is there someone that you can talk with about that? They can also serve in a convening role um, so that say you have an issue that involves HUD and FEMA and those two agencies aren't talking together. Um, they can try to do some facilitation around that and cross agency linkages. Um, another thing that just on a side is that CRS also does a whole myriad of studies and um, provides other resources that might be helpful to you. Um, likewise, the Census Bureau, they could help you get access to that kind of information that might be helpful to you um, in that regard. Um, 
So there's really just an incredible wealth of things that those offices can do for you. And we'd really encourage you to reach out and develop those relationships. Um, and, you know, once you do that, then the next step might be an earmark or might be, um, you know, a, some other kind of appropriations request. Um, but, uh, you know, you can end up having a very fruitful um, relationship. And then they're there for you when you need them the next time. I hope that's helpful. Well, thank you, Anne and Catherine. Um, I know for me, that was extremely informative um, and something I wish I had had at the start of my career of knowing what all I was able to um, call on my representatives for and also just, you know, the the scope and, and things like that. So I do want to open it up. If anybody has any questions, you can drop them in the chat or um, I don't I don't think that we have the unmute option on on the webinar slide, right? So I think it's just through the chat. Um, but as you guys are thinking of questions, I have a couple just to start the discussion. So um, I know for us, whenever we submit a request for a project, if we get turned down, is it, you know, would you advise trying to pursue it again to pursue something else? And then what is sort of the timeline that you can expect a response for on a request? Good question. Um, let me maybe tackle that one in the scope of earmarks. Um, so one thing I think I forgot to mention is there's a difference on the House and the Senate side for how much, uh, how many requests that they can make. On the Senate side, senators can make an unlimited number of earmark requests. On the House side, members are limited to 15. Um, but there's always something helpful in making that request. Like we said, just making sure that your member, of, your members of Congress understand your priorities. Even if there's like your request is a long shot, it's still helpful just to have that communication to show what you're looking to do uh, for your city or your, your municipality. Um, and just make sure that, that priority is on the radar. Um, so if you are not selected in one year, I think it's absolutely worth trying again later. Um, and the same thing for, for letters of support for grants. There might be a reason that that member doesn't wanna write you a letter in this cycle. You know, Maybe they've already written one for someone who's applying um, for the same cycle that you are, but then for the next one, yeah, you might absolutely be at the top of the list. So definitely it's in, in my book, it's absolutely worth uh, making those repeated asks. And then as far as follow-up time, I think it depends a little bit on what you're, what you're looking for. Um, for our office, uh, getting back quickly to other elected leaders and other, other uh, local government folks was absolutely top of our priority list. Um, just you know, there's there's a multiplying factor for if we help you, then you can help 58 constituents with the same question. So you know, making those uh, being responsive to folks in your shoes was um, was really important to us. So we tried to do that really quickly. Um, it's definitely going to depend on the office, and again, it's going to depend on the request and just what kind of workload that team is handling right now. Um, if you haven't heard in a week, as my rule of thumb, definitely pick up the phone. And more and more quickly if it's urgent. Catherine, do you have perspective from your team? Yeah, I just also wanted to throw in um, related to grants um, that there is a very complex scoring, and um, and I, I recall that we had some organizations that would come to us saying they didn't understand why they were denied, um, and maybe had difficult um, difficulty getting the scoring sheets. That's something that you can definitely reach out to your congressional offices to say, hey, you know, can we get the scoring sheets, and even think about. Um, you know, could we do a briefing with HUD? You know, th those things can be asked. And if it's not appropriate, they will let you know. Um, but sometimes that additional information can help you be more competitive in the next round. Or they might discover, and every so often they discover an error as well. Extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So I'm going to read those, starting off with Lorelai's saying that she recently learned that some members of, have grant managers in district offices. I'm wondering if this is typical to do both House and Senate staff have these. Or can I maybe experience working with those, either of you? Um, I don't think I'd say it's typical, um, but there are definitely some. So I think maybe the, the piece of context that's helpful is there's no manual that you get when you become a member of Congress in the House or Senate that says you must do these things and here's how you're going to do them. It's really up to each member how they want to set up their priorities and how they want to deploy staff to meet those priorities. So if a member really wants to make sure like I am getting grants for my district, um, then they might hire the grants manager. Uh, but then for other offices where there are just fewer requests or 
they want to prioritize constituent services or legislation or comms, that might be less common. Um, I think a lot of times you'll see that as like a part of someone's portfolio. So like maybe the staff assistant in the district office will also handle a lot of the grants um, or the comms director will handle a lot of those grants. So it really depends. So I wouldn't go to a congressional office looking for a grants manager, but just be aware that some, some will have them at a priority level is going to be a little bit different. And I would just add um, that the, I think that function is in every office. It's, as you said, it's just a question of, of whether that person's wearing many hats um, uh, as well. Um, so that it's a it's a fair question to ask: Are they available to do that? Yeah, super helpful. And then Gretchen asks: Are there resources from Popbox that could be used as curriculum for city employees and community leaders? Love this question. I'm going to chime in on it, but then Anne um, may have some more to say on that. But so when I joined the Pop Box team, um, we have a lot of resources. They, I know Anne mentioned one in the presentation already. If you go to popbox.org/earmarks, it has our DIY earmarks guide of um, walking you through the process of how to submit your requests. And they also have a guide on casework that they've been working on updating. Um, and then that's the whole goal of what I'm trying to start with our network of uh, small to mid-sized cities is to be able to provide opportunities like this to um, provide more intensive training on how to navigate burnout or how to navigate difficult constituent requests that we get as local government leaders or um, best practices with data management, things like that. So that's that's the hope that we will provide more, more ongoing technical assistance and training moving forward. Definitely. And the only thing I'd add is just to say we're really excited. So our our work in the past is really focused on Congress because I think the original team was uh, was made of former congressional staffers, but we are delighted to be responsive if there's something that you're looking for. So please don't hesitate to reach out um, if there's something in particular that you need. Is there a particular piece of curriculum you're not seeing covered anywhere else? The other thing that I'll, I'll flag um, on our website is we also have a guide to civic experience metrics. Um, that's, I think, super interesting and helpful for congressional offices. Um, uh, local governments on how to how to measure constituent satisfaction, how to measure the civic experience that you're providing to constituents through your services. Um, so definitely worth checking that one out in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So one other question that I'll offer up, and then if there's any others, again, feel free to drop those in the chat and appreciate y'all that have done so. Um, but I love that you guys talked about how casework is nonpartisan, because I think sometimes being a leader in local government, it, it feels like a battle at times with local versus state versus federal and trying to just align on our priorities. But at the end of the day, we, we all want to meet the needs in our communities and we all want to make our communities great places for people to live. So um, just any advice on how, you know, you're navigating the political sphere with your with your uh, representative's office and then just how you, you can see gov local government and federal government working together best. Yeah, Catherine, do you want to jump in? Big questions. I would, I mean, I, I think that it's a it's such a huge opportunity to really be nonpartisan and to express that um to you know constituents sort of build, you know, uh, a more uh friendly, warm uh sort of civic dialogue. And and I, I know in our state, uh we had a Republican governor and uh all Democratic uh congressional delegation. Um and there was tremendous respect between the two in part because um you know uh the governor could see how responsive the congressional delegation was to the needs that that he brought forward. So um, I think one of the exciting things about this casework navigator program and looking at casework is it is sort of that hopeful place in government where you can see how uh, people can work together. Um, and so you might even have a member who's not interested in doing earmarks because of their political philosophy. Um, but you could be asking the question, well, you know, how do you, how do you know, what's your role with grants? Um, or, or might there be a policy change? Maybe it's not about money. Um, it's just about um, eligibility for, for a program or um, uh, another program that we were very successful with here in Vermont is um, uh, housing tax credit. Um, that, that's something that leverages um, private dollars to a public good um, and, you know, doesn't cost, uh, you know, the federal government anything um, in terms of direct outlay. So lots of opportunities there. And you probably have some other examples. 
Yeah, definitely. It's such a good question. Um, and I always kind of broke my heart when I was doing casework and I'd get a constituent who would call and say, mm, I didn't vote for your member. Can you still help me? Um, it was one of the things I, I think there's kind of some misconceptions floating around out there. I always want to be really clear. Like there is a, like with uh, many of your teams, there is a very, very clear distinction between the official office, the governing office and the campaign office. So when you, um, and the district staff in particular, I think the, the official staff really pride themselves on saying, we're totally separate from the campaign. I don't care what party you're in. I don't care who you voted for. I have no way of knowing what party you're in or who you voted for. I have no way of knowing where you've donated, who you've donated to, uh, what you've said on social media, unless I go looking for it. So just kind of coming coming to that office, just with the, the assumption that no matter where you are, they're there to work with you. is really important. And also just thinking I am putting your shoes in putting yourself in the member's shoes at the end of the year, at the end of the Congress, like when they are making the case for themselves, they want to be able to show that, you know, no matter which party I'm in, here are the 38 cities and towns in my district, I've done something for each one of them. So I've brought a grant back to this one. I brought an earmark back to this one. I got a FEMA regulation change that helped this one. Um, so that office really depends on knowing what your priorities are to show that they're being responsive to you no matter which side of the aisle that you're on. Um, so again, just having those conversations, even though they may be uh, on the different on the different side of the aisle from you is so important. Well, hey, I really appreciate both of you and your time today and your wealth of knowledge and expertise in this area. And just encouraged to hear that, you know, at the end of the day, whether it's at the federal level or at the local level, all, all, we, all of us are just committed to trying to make government work better for people and just meet the needs of people. So um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to wrap it up. But I did want to let you guys know that you can remind you that you can access some resources on our website, the earmarks guide that we've mentioned, casework guide, civics experience that... Um, Anne mentioned. And then if you're interested in being involved in our network or more conversations like this, you can feel free to reach out to me directly, lauren at popbox.org. And we'll be sending out more um, information as I get ready to roll out the network soon with other opportunities like this to have ongoing conversation, resources, presentations, things like that. But thank you for your time and being engaged today. And I hope that you take advantage of these opportunities and that it was helpful to you. So thank you. <laughs>